I'd like to call the September 17, 2013 meeting of the Planning Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. First, approval of the minutes from the August 20, 2013 Planning Board meeting. Two, Rudy Site Plan Amendment. Three, Old Hayfield Road Private Road Review. Four, public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, followed by adjournment. So let's start off with the approval of the minutes. Any comments, questions, errors, omissions, any changes, anyone? Move they be accepted as written. Seconded. Thank you. Motion by Carol Ann, seconded by Henry. Any discussion on the minutes? Um, then seeing none, all those in favor of the minutes? All those opposed? All of those abstaining? Thank you, Joe. One abstention. Okay, minutes passed unanimously. Next item on our agenda is the Rudy Site Plan Amendment. Oh, okay. Um, hmm? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, and this is the uh, 517 Ocean House Road LLC is requesting an amendment to the approval granted December 20, 2011 and then amended October 16, 2012 for Rudy's, an 80-seat restaurant and a Phase 2 Village Retail 1,240 square feet building located at 517 Ocean House Road. The amendments are proposed to allow two bump outs amounting to 70 square feet at the rear of the structure, plus related amendments to the sewer easement and building adjustments. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulation. Uh, this application will be addressed in the following format. There will be an introduction of the item by the town planner, followed by a presentation by the applicant. The board will then discuss whether sufficient information has been provided to consider the amendment, and this will be followed by a discussion from the board on the amendment, including a decision on a possible site walk and or public hearing, concluding with a motion for the board to consider. So Maureen, would you please provide us with an overview? Sure. Um, this is a project that you approved December 20th, 2011, and what you approved was an 80-seat restaurant and a 1,250 square feet built foot um, phase two building and then in October of 2012 there were some amendments requested those specifically had to do with taking the upstairs storage and turning it into an apartment and at that same meeting the approval was extended for one year so now the applicant is working on an approval that expires on October 16th of this year they have already received a building permit for the current valid site plan and they're looking for changes that are limited to um, these two rear bump outs at the back of the, of the building. And that was complicated yeah, by the fact that there's a 30 foot wide right. easement that runs right behind the building underground to support a public sewer line. And uh, no encroachments of a structure are allowed within that easement. So the easement also had to be moved further away from the building. And the applicant has obtained um, an easement from the abutting property owner so that they could preserve the width of the 30 foot wide sewer easement but they can and the but they they can still have this bump out for the building um, the actual easements were going to are have to be approved by the council the council had a meeting last week and they did approve this revised sewer easement in the revised location subject to site plan approval from the planning board so uh, the applicant has expressed a desire to get going on this as quickly as possible. Thank you. Sure. And if the applicant would like to address the board, um, could you just please state your name for the sure. record? Sure. My name is Pat Carroll, and I'm with Carroll Associates, and I'm here tonight representing um, Rudy's on this application amendment. Um, as Maureen kind of indicated, um, I guess first of all, I wanted to make a make an announcement here that, um, that the original Rudy's, the old Rudy's, actually came down today. So there's definitely progress being made on this project. Um, everybody seems very excited about it. Um, there were school buses that were stopping. Um, Caroline was saying that uh, they were handing out bricks to people, kind of souvenir bricks. And so there's, there's the beginnings of kind of something really great about to happen here. So uh, we're all pretty excited about this. And, 
And I know that Paul has uh, indicated to me that he thinks construction will probably start within 30 to 60 days. So um, by springtime, the new Rudy should be open. Um, the reason we're here before you, as Maureen indicated, is that uh, the original plan, and I, I apologize, I'm just terrible at this kind of stuff, but um, I can't zoom in. I can't seem to, oh, here we go. Um, I'm just not a Mac person, so. Um, the original Rudy's, there was a sewer easement, and it, and it runs, um, there's, there's an existing sewer line that comes across here, and it cut right across where the, where the proposed line, or the proposed building's gonna go. And so as part of the amended plan back in 2011, 2012, uh, we actually rerouted that sewer line around the building like this. And then it continues on. It's actually stubbed right here for uh, future development of the uh, Davis Point Road neighborhood in case they ever decide to kind of tie into um, public sewer. So there was a there was a 20-foot sewer easement that was that was enacted in the original approval. Uh, that sewer easement, that 20 feet, went right tight to the back of the building here, and you can see this is the back side of the building. Um, this is where the kitchen and kitchen prep and kind of the back of the kitchen kind of deliveries and so forth is. Um, and it ran right tight against that, that wall. And as the designs evolved, um, Mr. Woods hired a kitchen consultant to kind of help lay out the, the restaurant kitchen and um, came to the conclusion that in a couple of key areas there, they could really benefit by the, a couple of three foot bump outs on that side. Um, one being for an oven and the other being for to increase the area required or allowed for uh, dishwashing and, and uh, uh, those types of kitchen prep activities. So unfortunately that, that bumped us into the sewer easement so we worked with uh, Bob Malley at the town we worked with the neighbor and, uh, and were able to kind of shift that sewer line and that sewer easement about three and a half feet, three feet uh, further to the west uh, that allowed then for these bump outs to occur outside of the, uh, the sewer easement. Um, the other thing we did in the original approved plan, there was a grease trap that was located within that easement and in discussions with Bob Malley, he didn't want any type of structures uh, even though it's associated with sewer uh, within that easement. So we actually moved the grease trap to the front of the building. It comes out of the building here and it's located in this point. It ties into the, to the existing, to the new sewer line here. So uh, those are really the, the two major changes. One being that the building itself uh, got about 70 f square feet larger. Uh, there's a bump out here that's about three feet by eight feet and a bump out here that's about three feet by 15 feet. Um, and then the sewer line actually got shifted. This, this uh, east-west line of the sewer line got extended by three feet and then it runs basically offset three feet through here to that same point where it's kind of, there'll be a manhole and a stub for future service through here. So, um, so all we've really done is kind of adjusted the plan to accommodate those changes. Uh, there's a couple minor little changes like a door with this doorway shifted a couple of feet uh, so we shifted the sidewalk over uh, this doorway shifted a couple of feet this way and we shifted shifted things around but but by and large um, the building and the site is um, consistent with what was originally approved so I think with that um, you know that's why we're here is just to for this minor amendment um, I think it probably could have fallen under a de minimis change with the exception of the fact that because there's a, a public right-of-way, a sewer right-of-way involved, that it, it is required to go through the board for an amendment. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Uh, first, let's start off with does the board uh, feel they have um, sufficient information to consider the amendment? I see an agreement. Okay, then proceeding. Uh, we have consensus on that. Does anyone on the board have any comments, uh, questions regarding the I item? I have a question, and I don't, I'm not sure who it's to, but 
uh, and it's a, sort of a small point, but are we approving simply the moving of the easement or are we appro also approving the change to the floor plan in the restaurant? Um, you're not approving the change in the floor plan, but you are approving the change in the footprint of the restaurant. So that 70 square feet bump out is, is something that you're approving as well as the easement. If they wanted to completely rearrange the interior of the restaurant and still have no more than 80 seats, that wouldn't trigger a planning board review. Yeah, we're still maintaining a, the 80 seat maximum number inside. Any questions down here? I guess I had a question on the um, letter from the town engineer. Have you looked through all of the changes that were requested? Are any of I have. I, Maureen uh, sent me that letter from um, Steve Harding, and um, we've reviewed that. We've, had, in fact, these plans that are up here tonight on the on the screen. Probably 90% of those changes have been incorporated into those plans. I think what they were, for the most part, are just some minor kind of uh, editing and kind of just bookkeeping as far as uh, some of the text and uh, graphics go with the plan. I, I didn't see anything in there that, uh, that was substantial and, and were more than willing to, to make those changes. I guess my question, my question for Maureen and you both was, do you, Maureen, consider these changes to be sufficiently clear um, that you would have no question determining whether or not they had been addressed? Or do you see anything here? It just seemed like anything here that might make you inclined to think that we should take a look at it again? Or is it all pretty black and white based on what you're seeing? I had a meeting with um, town staff, including the town engineer, and it was our sense that um, this was very minor stuff. Um, the failure to turn on a layer or, or to not make an adjustment to the location of a note. So I don't, we didn't have any concerns with these changes getting done. Okay, and so when it says the arrows don't point to the appropriate place, you know where they're supposed to point. Yes. That's all sufficiently clear. Well, there was one note on there pointing to a place, and the note doesn't even apply anymore. So it just needs to be removed. But that's all. Okay. Yes, it's all. And I, it, and it's, I think it's the most minor of things. And I think, too, that you know, part of the process here is that we'll make all those changes after tonight. We'll make all those changes and anything else that comes out of tonight's meeting, and we will submit those back to the town, and the town engineer will have a chance to kind of review those and sign off on the plans at that point. I think that's pretty standard. Yeah, right, and I guess given the number, it just seemed like there were an awful lot of changes. And given the number of changes, I just wanted to confirm that should we decide to go ahead and give approval, that from the town staff point of view, there are no ambiguities left in terms of what we intend, and that it would be easy to determine that the changes had been properly made. And given the number of changes and the fact that they're not all called out individually, I just wanted to confirm that, and it sounds like we're okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, Pat, under minor changes, um, I can see that you uh, corrected the number, that, or the architect has corrected it, to show that phase two is now 1,240 square feet. Right. Um, also under minor changes in the... Um, because I couldn't see off to the side there. Has the 70 uh, square feet been added to the impervious? Yes, we've gone back and recalculated all of the um, building footprint sizes and uh, impervious coverage sizes, and um, that's all. Is that, ref I can't quite read that. Is that all? It is, and I can, I can zoom in for you, maybe. Thank you. Um, Seem okay. better, but um, yeah. So that number definitely has changed. Okay. Yes. So we have changed. We have updated all those numbers. Um, okay. Yes. I know you haven't had a chance to review them yet, but you know I did. 
I did um, spend some time today kind of going through and updating all the, all the numbers relating to um, setbacks, uh, building footprint sizes for okay. phase one and phase two, and then, and then the total impervious coverage. I know it was a minor change, but I just noticed that these were the exact same numbers prior to the bump out. So right, and I, and I apologize for that. We kind of, we were kind of in a rush to get the application in. And, uh, details, details. Um, how about on um, uh, the planting, another small detail? Have you decided which plant you would like to go with? Um, I, you know, I, I guess I, Oops. not that I want to take exception to your comment, um, but... Um, on page, where are the plantings? Page three. Right. Okay. Um, I know you had called it. You had you had indicated you didn't think that uh, uh, Father Gia uh, was was a was a common name was Bottle Brush. Is it? It is. Okay. Um, I well, I mean, it's it's either dwarf Father Gia or dwarf bottle brush. I think it depends on which catalog you go by. But I looked it up. In fact, I I brought it tonight. If you want to see it, um, the O'Donnell's catalog calls it dwarf bottle brush. I'll fall back on your expertise. Okay. So there was a discrepancy though, because um, on the plant itself it said dwarf Father Gia, and the plant list it said uh, dwarf uh, bottle brush. Yeah. So we changed it. We modified it to just say Dwarf Father Gia, just to kind of clarify that. Okay, and that's the common name now? Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you for pronouncing all those. I didn't want to try to <laughs> do that. Okay. And um, my last minor is that on the seating, I'm not sure what page that was, I guess A1.2, it said... Um, this was a 50-foot um, seat, and I think that was inside. It didn't label how much was outside. Did you make the change, or would it we have, be we have, to just I have an updated plan from the, uh, uh, from the architects. Okay. Um, and if I can figure out how to... Slide it around here. Um, it, uh, now it says 80 seats total. And I think the way it breaks out is I think there's uh, 20, 27 seats um, in the screen porch, three seats for takeout, and the remaining 38 seats uh, would be inside the, uh, the restaurant itself. Okay. Those are just my minor yeah. points that I had. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? As long as they stay within 80 seats, are we saying that they that that division has to be that way are we actually approving that division or are we just saying that the maximum is 80 seats i thought how many were indoors and how many were outdoors remained up to them and could change from time to time as long as the perimeter didn't change that's always been my interpretation and, and the motions that you have approved over the years always refer to an 80 seat restaurant without differentiating between how many would be in the screen porch and how many. And I believe the original approval during the meeting, the applicant explained that some of, those, some of the seats from the screen porch would be moved indoors um, in the winter. So in that was my recollection too, yeah. which is part of why I had so we're asked just the question. Focusing on 80. Okay. And so actually, um, we're not actually approving a seating plan and we're not actually approving a floor plan layout, correct? Yeah, I've always treated the floor plan as a check that the applicant is doing what they tell us they're doing. You know, if you say you have an 80-seat restaurant and then you look we at the floor plan it. and there's 120, it becomes a little bit more questionable. Um, so that's how we've always used the floor plan. But again, I, I do believe that if the applicant wanted to change the interior and move a kitchen to a different side of the building, as long as it was still 80 seats, and it was still a restaurant that would be consistent with the site plan because we tend to look at the building outward. And on the various plan sheets, as you're now, the plan sheets that we have in front of them, there is a floor plan of the building that's sort of in light lines underneath it. Right. I think what I see up here, that all comes out. 
at least on the first one? Yeah, I, I pulled that out because I think there was one of Steve Harding's comments was that it was too hard to read some of the text that was inside the, um, the building envelope itself, you know, that says, you know, ADC restaurant and there were some other notes that were inside there. And graphically, it was kind of confusing with the, with the lines from the floor plan itself. And the floor plan doesn't really need to be on the site plan. It's really more a footprint or perimeter that's, that's important. So is it going to be in or is it going to be out? I think it's going to be out. It's, it's, it's going to be it's consistent. Part. Is it going to be in in some places? No, not on the site plans. It, the floor plans are part of the file. Right. And we use them for verifying that the proposed use is actually what is being but proposed. This first page that we're approving is not going to have that on it. Not unless you want it on there. I mean, we can. When you just showed it up here, it appeared like you had removed it. I we had. Confirming that you had. That's fine with me. No, okay. I think it's more appropriate. And it was really a matter of. It was just a matter of clarity to try to right. make the plan read a little bit better. Is all. I think it's better for it not to be there, but others may have different views. I have a question for Maureen. So Maureen, is, um, is it correct that in the BA district, restaurants are limited to 80 seats? Right now, yes. Yes. And so um, if that were to change, would uh -huh. Rudy's have and say more seats would be allowed in the BA? Would Rudy's have to come back in and amend their site plan? In my opinion, once you get an approval for number of seats, that's the approval that you're left with. And if you want to increase the number of seats, you're supposed to come back to the board and amend your approval. And could Rudy's instead um, submit a plan that says 80 seats or the maximum number allowed um, under the ordinance? It would perhaps be a shame if that were to change and they had I, to come I would, back. I would question that because number of seats has other issues attached to it, specifically parking and sewer service capacity. Now, I wouldn't expect that adding 20 seats would be a problem with sewer service capacity, but you are going to need a parking space for every four seats. And so I think you would want an applicant to come back if they need to increase the number of seats. Gotcha. Um, and if you could have more than 80 seats, do you think your client would have changed their application if more were allowed in the BA? Um, you know, not presently, no. Not presently? No. Okay. I think Thank that, uh, you know, they are very happy with the floor plan and the layout, and they're happy with 80 seats. Um, I think, you know, we have had discussions about if it were to expand to 100 at some point in time, and we understand that there's, you know, that's, that's probably six months or more out from, from now that, um, that that would even be adopted into the ordinance. Um, that it may be something that happens upstairs. There's space upstairs that uh, was, I think it's, it's programmed now as an apartment but there could potentially be some seating up there. Um, other than that, you know, the, the floor plan itself is pretty maxed out, so um, I don't think he's going to try to jam another 20 seats downstairs. Um, but I think, you know, his, his attitude is let's get it built and let's get it open and see how it works, and um, if by that time it's, it's worth pursuing another 20 seats, we might do that. Okay. Are you aware of activities with code enforcement with the other restaurant in the BA district regarding the number of seats? I know that they're, they're the, the, the other restaurant is what's pushing this uh, zoning amendment to the 100, or the 100 seat uh, question. So. Okay, good, thanks. So, yeah, we're, it's a small town. Good. I think it's important <laughs> that you are aware, so I'm glad. Okay. Any further questions from the... Carolyn. I just have, we did receive, we did receive one, one comment from uh, an abutter, and it had to do with the plantings. I looked at the plan, and my understanding is the plantings were always part of phase one. They were never part of phase two. So I just wanted to bring that up so that the abutter would know. We did look at it. We did address it. And that plantings are part of phase one, and phase two is just that building. And that is well, I, I would clarify that most of the plantings are part of phase one. Okay. There are some, some plantings in particular, if I can get back to uh, this page. They're, they're basically foundation plantings right in front of the phase two building. Yep. Right. Rather those but there are part of phase any, of the, any of the That's perimeter right. planting the perimeter along. plantings are all phase one. Are all phase one, yes. yes. Thank you. That is correct. Okay. 
Um, then at this time, any other questions for Pat? Then if there is any public comment, I would ask that anyone would like to comment. Okay, not seeing any. Okay. Then um, would the board like to schedule a site walk? No. Any interest in a site walk? No. Okay. Would the board like to set a public hearing for October 15th? Do you repeat that? Uh, would we like to schedule a public hearing? <coughs> no interest in a public hearing? No? Nope. Okay, then. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion then? I'll make a motion. Thank you. Um, motion for the board to consider finding of facts. 517 Ocean House Road, LLC is requesting an amendment to the approval granted December 20th, 2011, and then amended October 16th, 2012 for, Ru for Rudy's, an 80-seat restaurant, and Phase 2 vi Village Retail, 1,250-square-feet building located at 512 Ocean House Road, to add two bump-outs totaling 70 square feet and shifting the sewer easement, which requires review under Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations. Number two, the town engineer is recommending several clarifying revisions to the plan. Number three, the application substantially complies with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations, subject to the submission of information referenced in number two above. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of 517 Ocean House Road LLC for an amendment to the approval granted December 20, 2011, and then amended October 16, 2012, for Rudy's, an 80-seat restaurant in Phase 2 Village Retail, 1,250-square-foot building located at 517 Ocean House Road, to add two bump outs totaling 70 square feet and shifting the sewer easement be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised per the comments of the town engineer in this letter dated September 17th, in his letter dated September, 7, uh, September 11th, 2013, and that no construction of the new building shall commence until the plans are revised and submitted to the town planner. I'll second, and then I'd like to make a couple of amendments. <laughs> yes, would you like to amend that? I'd like to amend the, uh, in the finding of facts number one and in uh, the general heading at the, of the motion that the village retail be 1,240 square feet in both of those places instead of 1,250 to comply with the, change, the plan. Is that okay with you, Liza? Yes, that is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. All right. Then, motion by Liza, seconded by Carol Ann. Any discussion on this motion? Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Um, all those in favor? All those opposed? And abstaining? Thank you, Henry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is Old Hayfield Road, Private Road Review. Stephanie Boggs is proposing a private road to be constructed within the paper street of Elizabeth Road, located off Reef Road, to create access to a back lot located at the end of Elizabeth Road. The new private road will be named Old Hayfield Road. The plans will be reviewed for compliance with the private road standards in the subdivision ordinance. <coughs> this application will be addressed in the following format. The town planner will provide an overview, followed by a presentation by the applicant. The board will then discuss completion, followed by a motion for the board to consider. 
If the application is deemed complete, the board will begin discussion of the item, including a decision on a site walk and or a public hearing. And then we'll, we will conclude with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, and can you also maybe update us on paper streets, just kind of, um, yeah. please, <laughs> along with the other. Thank okay. you. Okay, so I'm going to use John's math if that's okay. <clears throat> so the lot in question is this long back lot in here, which is owned by um, Spogs and it doesn't have any frontage on a town road. The Boggs met to live in this lot right here, I believe, and they would like to create formal access to this lot. Um, this is a paper street over here called Elizabeth Road, and um, I'm gonna skip over the whole paper street thing for the moment, but the, the little bit of irony is that any, any property, let's assume no rights have expired, any lot that was shown on the plan that created Elizabeth Road has rights to use Elizabeth Road, not just people who have frontage on Elizabeth Road. This lot was not included in the subdivision that created Elizabeth Road, but this lot right here was in the subdivision that created Elizabeth Road. So as long as they live here, they have rights to use this road. And under that scenario, they're proposing to create this private road and get it recorded with the intent to um, formalize their access to this lower lot. Um, there's no proposal at this time to build anything on this lot. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Um, so the applicants have submitted information that is similar to what you would get for a private access way permit, specifically that there is a passing test pit there. But this isn't a private access way review. It's a private road review. If the applicants wanted to build um, access just for this lot, they could put a private access way in this Elizabeth Road. But this lot right here, there's actually a second lot in the back that's a lot of record. So by creating a private road here, they're making it possible for this lot to gain frontage and this lot right here to gain frontage. So that's why they're proposing a private road. Um, a private road is supposed, is supposed to meet the same standards as a public road, which is 22 feet wide, uh, paved, but the ordinance does recognize that a private road is separate from a public road, so it doesn't have to be paved. It still has to have the gravel base. Further, the subdivision ordinance has the opportunity for the planning board to grant a waiver from standards. So in the past, you have allowed people to get a private road approval and build what is physically what looks like a private access way. So a private access way is typically 18 feet wide, eight inch, 18 inches deep of gravel. And what you've allowed people to do is have a 14 foot wide traveled way and then a two foot wide shoulder on each side, which totals 18 feet of width. You further allowed people to put loam and seed on those two foot wide shoulders just so it visually narrows up the road. And I, I just bring it up because I know it's been a question. For example, Old Sea Point Road, um, was approved, I think it was last year, was approved using the same design that this, this road is, pro is proposed at, which is a 14 foot wide traveled surface with two foot wide gravel shoulders, creating that 18 foot wide gravel base, 18 inches of gravel deep to support the ladder truck. So with that, I'm gonna stop, unless there are any questions. Any questions about uh, paper streets? Anyone want to be uh, an update on that, Elaine? No, I, I have one, Maureen. Okay. Would you like a I little guess my question refresh? Was, who owns the paper street and who has the right to request well, it? Well, in 1996, the town had a study done of all of its paper streets, and it was done in response to uh, legislation passed in Augusta that said that in 1997, all town, all paper streets were going to expire unless towns built them or otherwise extended the rights. So the town of Cape Elizabeth did an inventory and in 1997, before the rights expired, they extended their rights in all the paper streets in town except for a handful. And the ones they didn't extend were ones they had no expectation of ever needing those paper street rights for anything and there were I think three or four sections in Delano Park and there were a couple in what is now Hemlock the uh, Hamlin Street subdivision 
So this is not an area where the, the town let their rights expire. They, ex they extended their rights in all the other streets. And this report also had um, a legal opinion in it prepared by the Maine Municipal Association that said that we could extend our rights for 20 years and that there were two types of rights. There were rights that were conveyed, the act of recording the subdivision conveys rights to the town, rights of incipient dedication, that we can go in there, we can build the road. It also conveys uh, an implied easement, let me get those two mixed up, for all the lot owners on the plan that created the paper street. So if you went in and you had five, five streets shown and 50 lots, every one of those lots had rights in all of those streets, whether they were built or not built. Now, there, there has been a lot of discussion lately about a specific paper street in Shore Acres, which is this neighborhood, and uh, an argument has been made that if the town has not built the road, their rights have expired. Um, they've cited court cases. Um, the court cases, and I, I hate to paraphrase attorneys because they always correct me later, um, but the court cases are very fact dependent. So it's really a case by case basis. Um, no one has made the argument as of right now that Elizabeth Road isn't still there. Um, and so these applicants are moving forward based on their own rights um, to get a private road recorded to, I guess, to, to, to strengthen their access rights to that back lot. But does everybody else in this, so who, but who owns it? Um, the and you ask, developers still it, own it? It may be. Who has to come to us Right. To make this request. It, it may be that the original developer owns it, but the answer that I'm usually given when I ask that question is it doesn't really matter because the rights to pass over that property are so burdensome that you really can't do anything with the land anyway. So um, it may be that the developer or his heirs own that property. It may be that a private entity has negotiated with his heirs to buy that underlying land, but as long as the rights um, still exist to go over the property, it doesn't make that much difference. If there was a motion to vacate the street, and there have been streets in this neighborhood immediately adjacent to this area that have been vacated, under the state legislation, if the town uh, votes to vacate a street, half of the land goes to one property owner, half of the land goes to the other property owner. So the, the land does get divided up between the abutters. So the lot that's making this application is the one that's shown on here now or formerly of Stephen Met? Yes. So but they, Stephanie Boggs now owns it? They are husband and wife. So they're, okay. they're so I'm trying to figure out who, who, who's our applicant. Our applicant Does officially applicant have to be the owner of the benefited parcel, which would be Stephen Met, because the Stephanie Boggs land is not currently benefited by that road. And I'm not sure that the house is not in Stephanie Boggs' name now as well. And I guess we can ask the applicant's representative to clarify that. But since we knew they were husband and wife, it seemed that there was enough rights there for them to exercise it and use Elizabeth Road. And nobody else in the subdivision has to agree to the creation of a private road here. The other people no, that write because the, don't have to the, agree. I mean, the only thing the other abutters could do is argue that the rights had, had expired because it's been too long since the plan was recorded to, um, to have had time to build the road. And we haven't, I mean, the town of Cape Elizabeth has not entertained those arguments up till now. And certainly, if we could take into court, we'll have to do that. Uh, but there are a lot of paper streets in Cape Elizabeth, and there are some, there are lots that rely on those paper streets for access. So it's, it's a bigger issue than, than just one or two places. If you build on this, rather, than, I guess it's an open piece of grass at the moment. For, um, for the most part. So if you build on it and you, you you set this house over here, which is on, which which is not unnumbered, or it belongs to Matthew and Dawn Hand, right? Then does it not suddenly become very close to the road and 
Well, you could argue that it's always been close to the road because that was the way that subdivision lot you could was argue, recorded. But then on the other hand, when you put asphalt there or whatever, then you you haven't got any buffering in there. You have just a come in. It's it's the way the lot was recorded when it was created. And was the ham, the Matthew and Dawn ham lot part of that lot when it was created, or was it part of a different? The ham lot was part of the subdivision plan that created all of these okay. lots, including the Elizabeth Road lot. So, so a planning board approved the permission to put this existing No, this was in the 1900s. It oh, was long okay. before we had planning board approval. It was, I own land, I draw up a plan, I bring it to the registry, and I record it. I guess listening to what you're saying, I would feel more comfortable, particularly if we're looking at precedent, if the application make it very clear that the owner of the lot that we're showing as Stephen Matt is joining in this application. Because otherwise, we don't have anyone who has any right to that road coming before us. And from what you say, it seems to me that should be an easy change to make. Um, I'm pretty sure the applicant can handle that. It's yep. pretty simple. Yep. Anyone else have any questions about paper streets or what's no? Okay. Then at this time. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, and I represent uh, Stephanie Boggs uh, for this application for a private road. Um, before I get started, I just want to mention to the board that uh, the, the series of plans that I've included in the PowerPoint uh, have been revised slightly um, to address all of the questions by AMAC. We received AMAC's comments uh, last Thursday, I believe. We've addressed those comments, we've revised the plans, and those are included um, in this evening's presentation. Uh, so as Maureen mentioned, uh, this is a 4.5 acre parcel, um, it's a back lot. Um, Stephanie and, and uh, Stefan live in this residence here. And um, this is the private access, I mean the uh, Paper Street, which is known as Elizabeth Road. And it extends from Reef Road back to the 4.5 acre parcel. Uh, so this application for a private road will provide uh, both access and road frontage to the 4.5 acre lot. Um, and again, the, you know, Stephanie and Stefan do not have any intention on building a house or developing the back lot. Um, the only purpose they're doing this is for uh, to maintain their rights uh, to keep this as a buildable lot. Uh, sheet two is, um, is the plan on the left is the layout plan and the creating a drainage plan. So the proposal consists of a 14 foot wide paved travel way that extends uh, roughly 340 feet back from Reef Road. Um, and we've provided a hammerhead turnaround in accordance with the town's uh, standard for a turnaround. Um, the site distance is, is very good at this point here. Uh, one of the comments from AMAC was to uh, designate the actual site distance on the plan, which I've done uh, on the grading and drainage plan. It's difficult to, to read it, but there's over 350 uh, feet of clear site distance in either direction. Uh, the emergency, another comment was uh, from AMAC was to uh, extend the turnaround a few feet into the bogs lot uh, to provide a minimum 50 foot uh, dimension um, uh, for the easement for the turnaround. So I've done that, it, it shifted. I think uh, eight feet uh, back into the bogs lot. So that's been addressed. 
the existing conditions of the Papist Street, uh, there are some pretty uh, sensitive uh, areas that consist of a, a rather steep topography. It, 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 it goes up to a high point. There's about 11 foot grade change. Uh, there's a high point here next to the three large oak trees and then it declines uh, fairly sharply. Um, and there are, as I mentioned, three large mature oak trees here and one there. Um, and there are and there are ledge conditions at the top of the at the top of the knoll. So for those reasons, um, and in, primarily to uh, preserve the the oak trees uh, that are within the right of right of way, uh, we're requesting a waiver. Uh, the first waiver would be to offset the center line of the right of way. Uh, five feet. Uh, the planning board uh, has the um, has the right to grant a waiver if it's to preserve uh, existing vegetation. So we've taken advantage of that uh, that language in the subdivision ordinance. We've offset the the center line of the right of way five feet um, uh, all the way through the paper street. And for some reason, this right-of-way varies. It's 50 feet wide at this point and about 53 feet wide uh, at the rear. But we have maintained that five-foot offset. And that was another comment by AMAC uh, asking us to, to, uh, to do that, which we have. The second waiver uh, is the road width, as Maureen mentioned. Uh, this has been done on similar situations in the past but we're proposing a 14-foot wide paved uh, traveled way with two-foot wide gravel, uh, grass shoulders on either side for a total of 18 feet wide. And the third waiver uh, would be the roadway grade. Uh, the subdivision ordinance requires a 3% grade for the first 50 feet from an intersecting road. Um, that would be right in this area here. Uh, in order to, if we were to maintain 3% for 50 feet, it would definitely kill those trees. Uh, we'd have about a, a four or five foot cut by the time we got to the top of the knoll. So we're asking for a, uh, a waiver on that requirement. What we're proposing is to take the road 3% for 30 feet, the thir first 30 feet, and then it would transition into a 5% grade before it uh, went up. I think we've got 12% uh, after that 50 feet. So it'd be 3% for 30 and then 20 and then 5% for the remainder of the 20 feet. Um, this has been reviewed by AMAC uh, and I believe the town staff, uh, Bob Malley, and um, at least AMAC, who I've spoken with today, agrees with our, our proposal. Uh, but, you know, again, if we had to, if we had to keep the 5%, it would uh, absolutely, it would get into the roots of, uh, of those trees big time, and it would, you know, definitely kill the, kill the trees. Um, The utility plan, uh, there is an existing eight inch water main in Reef Road and we're providing a two inch service uh, to the end of the road uh, for domestic water. Um, electric telephone and cable will be underground from an existing utility pole located uh, uh, about halfway up the, or very close to the high point of the, uh, of the roadway. And sanitary sewer, uh, we are proposing, and we've demonstrated in our in, in your the booklet. We have a uh, uh, a letter and a soil log from Al Frick, who has been out to the back lot, has dug, dug a test pit, and has uh, 
signed off on suitable soils for an on-site disposal system for the back lot. So that's what we would propose for sanitary sewer. Um, Stormwater, uh, let me go back to the grading and drainage plan. Um, for stormwater, um, if, you, if you've taken, if you've read the stormwater report, which is in our application, um, I believe it's Exhibit 10, uh, you'll see that the increase in runoff um, is almost negligible in the two-year, 10-year, and 25-year storm. Uh, what happens currently, there's a drainage divide at the high point. The runoff coming towards Reef Road uh, flows down uh, the Abutters driveway. It comes onto Reef Road, follows Reef Road down to there's a couple catch basins down at the end of Reef Road. Uh, the stormwater that runs in a northerly direction basically runs over the, the grass and woodland and um, flows across the, um, the bog lot and eventually gets into Al White Brook. Um, what we, I mean, we're not proposing because of the insignificant increase in runoff. We're not proposing to do any sort of detention um, of, the, of the runoff. Um, I, in, in Amex letter, they asked that we would dig a test pit uh, in this vicinity here to determine the depth to ledge and determine the type of soil. Uh, we did that, in fact, we did it this afternoon with Al Frick. Uh, we determined that there is a 37-inch depth of soil before you hit ledge. And, um, you know, I reported that back to Steve Harding, and we went back and forth and discussed um, some solutions to controlling the runoff. I believe it's... It's his, it's his recommendation that we install either a dry well or a rain garden uh, at the lower part of the proposed uh, private road. <clears throat> I don't think, personally, I don't think a dry well would work because you've got to have some depth, more than 37 inches, in order for a dry well to function. Um, <clears throat> a rain garden would be a better solution in my mind uh, the, the runoff would be directed to the rain garden. Uh, it would infiltrate, it would be, a rain garden is a very shallow depression in the soil planted with wetland plants. And it would allow the runoff to infiltrate uh, down into the rain garden, be absorbed, um, and hope, you know, back into the groundwater. So that would be, if, if the planning board feels that that is something that they would like to see. That is something that we can show on our next submission. Um, but once again, it's, it's a very slight increase in the, in the amount of impervious surface and runoff. And, you know, I, I just, I hate to do things that aren't going to, just to, to do it, just to, you know, uh, put it in. Um, it will function um, on, on smaller storm events, but I don't think it's going to function uh, the way that a rain garden is supposed to function on a peak storm event, on a, you know, a 10 or a 25 year storm event. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, we've, we've addressed all of the items on, on AMEX. Uh, there, a lot of the comments were very minor in nature. Uh, they wanted, to, wanted us to add a couple of details, with, which we've done. Um, this, um, this detail right here is a detail that they've asked us to do, which is a, um, a saw cut detail. So uh, with that, uh, I will
conclude and open it up for any questions. Thank you. Does the board have any questions at this time? So, so let me get this straight. You are actually proposing to build. Henry, can this. you please not, sorry, excuse your microphone? This is not a theoretical. You actually physically propose. They're physically proposing to build it to actually lay it in place, or is it just possibly lay it in place? Possibly. If if at some point in the future someone decides to develop that back lot. Develop the back lot, this will be built. But it could be 10 years, 20 years time. Correct. So it may have changed by then. What will change? Uh, building codes might change, some private road well, controls. Well, once, you know, once this is approved, we're going to re record the plan at the registry. And how long do you then have for the permit to be valid? Or is it, it, is it does it not expire? Doesn't it? Once you record it, it's good forever. Lorena, okay. I'm curious, but um, I know you had mentioned with Rudy's that their approval of a year ago was about to expire in October. Uh -huh. How is that site plan expiring different than this? Because it, it's exactly it. It's the, you have, this is under a different set of rules. Um, the site plan regulations are in the zoning ordinance. And in the site plan regulations, it says that site plans are good for one year and that they expire at the end of a year unless you've pulled a building permit. You can also go to the planning board and request a, an extension, one one-year extension. So site plans are very different. The subdivision ordinance treats approvals differently, and that's been the choice of the town of Cape Elizabeth. In Cape Elizabeth, if you, and also site plans are not required to be recorded in the registry of deeds. So subdivisions, and this private road review comes out of the subdivision ordinance. A subdivision approval needs to be recorded within 90 days, or it is deemed, um, the, the approval is deemed no longer valid. Um, the an applicant can come to the board within the 90-day period and ask for one 90-day extension. So you have 180 days to get your approval recorded in the Registry of Deeds. And once it's recorded, it's good forever. Uh, private access way permits are in the zoning ordinance, but it's a separate type of review. And again, um, you have 90 days to have those recorded, and once they're recorded, they are not, they do not expire. So it's, it's out of ordinance. Elaine? Following up on that point, when you record a subdivision plan, the original developer or whoever owns the subdivision roads is responsible for the town for making sure they're built in accordance with our requirements. In this case, we have the owner of a back lot and the owner of the front lot asking for this access road. Who's responsible if it's built 20 years from now to making sure that it's constructed in accordance with our requirements and that, in fact, it, it is constructed as is shown there? If, if it's done wrong, who is it that we can look to? When the private road for Old Sea Point Road was approved, um, the, the applicant came and had a pre-construction meeting with the town and the town did some inspections out there to verify that the road was built according to the approved plans. And you rely on having that um, verification in order to be able to count the frontage towards a buildable lot. So um, not that I like to predict what's going to happen 20 years from now, but the ordinance does have provisions for that. I mean, you're, you're supposed to be, I mean, in Old Sea Point Road, they provided a performance guarantee, which the town held while they were doing construction so that we could make sure that the road was built the way it was approved to be built. The same thing could happen with this road whenever it is approved. The other thing you so mentioned. The person who would, who would want to get a building permit for this back parcel would have to build the road build the road and they would then become responsible. It, it could happen a couple of different ways. It could be that, I mean, the, the current owners could decide that um, <coughs> they want to market the lot and it'll market better if they build the road. I mean, they could come in and build the road themselves and we would go through this inspection process. Um, 
they could sell the lot and someone else could come in and say they want to build the road. I suppose, since it is an approval under the subdivision ordinance, you could make the argument that if there is an owner other than the current owner, that the planning board would have the authority to review that new owner, just like you do with any subdivision, because you look at financial and technical capability. But we tend to not do that with private roads. It's, I mean, that's one of the struggles, I think, the, this applicant knows that this is more um, to secure rights than to propose for construction. At the same time, town staff are saying, look, you know, that doesn't really make any difference for us. We need to have a plan that someone can take and, and go ahead and build. Um, and that's why you're seeing some of these, these comments being made by staff, because we're treating it as if it will be built upon approval. So, as I understand it, at present, the owner of the back lot, assuming you don't merge the two lots because they're uncommon, the owner of this back lot has no rights in this road. The we are not giving those rights, are we? Because they're not in. No, I would, I mean, and, and the applicants have not made any other arguments. This is what we came up with, and, and the owner of the house lot has rights in Elizabeth Road. The front, the rock lot that also has access on Overlook Lane. Correct. But the so owner they, of the They can propose this private road and get it recorded as part of their rights on the house lot. But we're not granting the fact that we have cre made this a road mm -hmm. doesn't grant any rights in that road to the owner of this back lot, or does it? because they don't have those rights now, if I understand you correctly. We, you may want to, that's a good point, you may want to put something in there that explicitly conveys rights well, for this I'd lot. Be because it's to specifically if it was not a, a, convey them unless and until the built road was built in compliance with. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't um, by having Stefan Mete, co-applicant, provide that, um, provide the rights wouldn't provide the rights to the owner of the back lot, no, not unless those two lots would somehow be merged. Well, even if they were merged, I wouldn't think so. So I'm not, I, I just think we need to be clear whether we are or whether we aren't giving rights of passage well, I, to the my, back lot, and it strikes me but, that but, we're well, not. If, it, if this was a public road and, and the applicants would ha have the right to propose to build a road to town standards and offer it to the town, and as long as they but built it not. to, but let me just take this through. If they built it to town standards and the town accepted it, because if it's built to town standards, the town will accept it, then we would not need to convey rights to the rear property owner because they would have frontage on the town accepted road. Right. So it may be possible for the current owners, as owners of the private road, to convey rights to that back lot as part of this approval. But they're not owners of the private road. They have rights in it, and they're they, not owners. And you can't convey. You can't. If you have an easement right, you can't convey an easement right to somebody else if you don't own it. So, the and you can't expand by giving rights to this back lot. You're ex quick take, not a legal opinion. Clearly, you're expanding the use of the easement. You can't do that without the consent of the landowner. So. I'm not sure we're getting all the way there, and I think we need to be clear what we can do and what we can't do. We may be able to say, sure, you can build a road here in accordance with town standards. What we can't do is give any legal rights to a landowner to use that road when that, or to, for a property to have legal rights of access to that road when that property doesn't have it. But and the what you're telling me is if this, is, if, if this <coughs> lot was not part of the original subdivision, therefore, that lot doesn't have any deeded rights to this road. I haven't looked at any documents, but just from what you've told me today. Well, following so on from what you said, what Stephanie Boggs is the applicant. No, Boggs. Stephanie, no Boggs, it's, it's, Stephanie Boggs doesn't have any right in this right, land. Right, but she's the applicant. That was my original yeah, point. Yeah. She doesn't have any right to be the applicant either. Right, right. But I, I believe the right to be right, but, but that's that's a, that's an obstacle that's a that can be point. easily overcome. That point can be easily overcome. But the, My second, the ability to to point, use a private road if you don't have rights in it is a question. Correct. So that kind of leads up 
in some way related to my other question, I'm looking at the configuration of the Stefan Matt plot. Looks like there's an 18-foot strip that could come off of the edge of that lot and provide a much shorter access. Now, maybe that creates more problems rather than fewer, but just another way I, to look I, at it. To follow up on that, I have two comments. I, I do want to, the point that you're making, I do want to find out what can we do to address that point. I don't want to just leave it here. If we can take that further to someone else who can give us a legal opinion. I think it's the applicant's job to okay. have their legal counsel show us that someone with appropriate right, title, and interest is making this application and to establish if we're approving this road on the assumption that it's a road for this back lot. And that's all the information we're given. That's why we're looking at septic and all the other things related to the use of the back lot. Mm -hmm. I think we need to know that that lot has rights in the road because the lot doesn't have any deeded right to cross that road if it's not a, pu a public road, then there's no st standing, for lack of a better word. Or ability to convey rights to it. Or ability to convey right to it. But that's not something we would ask the town council. No. That's no, okay. That's something that the applicant would have to establish. Okay, so we would be looking for more information. So the board is requesting. Yeah. Um, I, I would agree with that. Before we end this discussion, I'd like to ask if, if you can offer anything on this, in this regard. I may have to come to the mic. And come you please um, come to the mic podium, provide your name and address for the record. I'm Stefan Mette, I live at 5 Overlook Lane. Stephanie Boggs is my spouse. Um, and thank you for asking me to come up to explain uh, any questions you might have. Um, the first is that uh, it was, indeed was our attorneys that um, asked us or suggested to us back in 1996 to place um, the, the back lot, lot 46 I believe it is, the 4.5 acres in, in one name and uh, our house in another. Um, uh, understanding that even though the, the deeds state different names, by the fact that we are legally married, that that conveys equal uh, ownership. Um, but we will do whatever is required to. Um, if there's a question there, we'll change the um, the, the lot ownership if, that, that is, if that's needed. But I have a question: whether if I am the applicant, being the owner of Five Overlook Lane, um, even if the back lot is in my wife's name, uh, does that absolve the question? Does that solve the question? No. Okay. No, because the back lot was not part of the original subdivision. Therefore, the back lot, based on what Maureen said, the back lot has no deeded rights or rights by virtue of subdivision plan to use this road. So even if you owned both lots, it would not resolve the legal question. So did you buy the lot separately, or was it the, when you bought lot uh, book 13561, when you bought that, did you actually buy at the same time the back lot? I mean, was it conveyed as one, as one piece? No, they were separate lots. We separate bought them at lot. the same time and have been paying taxes as separate building lots. The, um, the town assessor has told us that the, it's a buildable lot and is taxed as such, and the only reason that we are uh, making application for a private roadway is out of concern of losing that lot, currently understood as buildable, taxed as such, uh, in 2017 uh, when the potential for the right of way, the right to use a right of way over Paper Street may disappear. Yes, it is possible, and I don't know if it's right or not, that that back lot has some deeded access from somewhere. But you would have to ask your counsel, title lawyers, whatever, whether that back lot has any deeded access. It may have deeded access across this subdivision road. If so, it should have been shown on the subdivision plan, and apparently wasn't. 
but it could be there. But just by creating this road, we don't create access rights, unless it, it becomes a dedicated public road, and then it, that may be a different conclusion. Maureen? They might be able to construct the road and convey rights by using the town's rights, because we have access rights that are not limited. Maybe. I would want, we, that would, again, be a legal question and not part of our. That will be a point that does need to be addressed. OK, thank you. If you'd like to certainly come to the podium. Stephanie Boggs, thank you. Just a quick question. So if my husband were co-owner of this back lot and he were requesting access to the back lot, would that not be sufficient? No, no. it would not. It, it, can I, Maureen, you know this better, but it's, it's because if you were to take out the old plan that this shows and you were to look at all the lots that made up of Shore Acres, you would not see the 4.5 acre lot. It's not there. Is that a There's correct summary? That or? is correct, because I, I did pull the plan. OK. But the, the, I mean, there's two issues. One is the lots in one name, and one lot's in mm -hmm. another name. And getting you to come in as co-owner should be perfectly an easy way to fix that. That's just adding mm -hmm. to the application form. But the second piece is this right to use the road. And um, I think what you would want to do is have your attorney make an argument that you're taking, you're using um, the town's rights of access to provide access to that back lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, just one other uh, comment. Even though that 4.5 acre plot was not part of the original subdivision, there is an extinguished paper street called Bayview that runs the length of that lot that was part of the, the subdivision. So um, th there is uh, 25 feet of extinguished subdivision road that is now incorporated into that lot that runs the entire length of that 4.5 acre. So maybe that lot as currently configured was not part of the subdivision, but part of the subdivision roadway system was, is part of that lot. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That might allow for some creative arguments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Elaine, I want to address the second part. You mentioned that um, you could possibly go up Overlook Lane, connect over the Mete's property to get back to the lot. I, I believe a site walk might um, show you whether or not that's a possibility because I drove out there and I think when you start looking uh, but yeah, anyways it be possible it's, it's, that's a complete that's a yes. completely different application and it just right but it might be a shorter it would be something that clearly the people presently in front of us have the right to yes. ask us right okay certainly uh, well Maureen had mentioned at the beginning that part of this uh, Creating this was also because the back half of um, the Julianne uh, revocable trust lot was also potentially a buildable lot, and this would give access to it. Is that part of this? No, no, it's not. Anyone else with any other questions? Uh, I, I do have a question for you, John. Um, back to um, the letter from the town engineer and number 13 where they talk about um, drainage and the small increase. Um, I, I hear what you're saying is that in a, in a really big storm, this is a, a, um, a rain garden, which you think is the better solution, yes. would not work in a very large storm. You're still going to get that sheeting. What, would a rain garden help that in the winter time, when you have those thaws and the and the snow starts to melt and it starts to come across. What we don't want is this big icy patch. Right. Does a rain garden with that help? Yes. Catch? Yes, it will. So it would help in that scenario? It would. It would, it would help. It's, it's just uh, in the, the real 
large mm -hmm. storm events that last for hours. Okay, but I'm also <clears throat> thinking about the rest of the year, mm -hmm. most of the year. <laughs> yep. yep. Okay, so rain garden would actually help. That might be something you might want to touch bases with again if the if AMAC brings this up again about the drainage. Okay, we were actually supposed to be looking at completeness, and I think we've gone past that. Um, what do I do at this point? Do I make it? Ask for a motion. Okay, I'd like a motion then. If anyone would, if are there any other other questions in regards to at least completion before we make a motion on completion? I don't have any motion in front of me. Okay, so you will not be making that motion. No. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'd like to, and um, I can certainly try to make one. I don't know where it is. Joe, can you hand her your memo? I didn't get one yet. Yeah, I have one. You have one? Mine is separate. I have one. I have to, I have to hear it. I'm sorry. You want it? Yeah. Shall I, Ben? Yes. Else would like to. Okay. Um, All right. So, um, motion for the board to consider. Um, motion for completeness. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Stephanie Boggs for a private road to be constructed within the paper street of Elizabeth Road, located off of Reef Road, to complete access to a back lot located at the end of Elizabeth Road be deemed incomplete. So incomplete. Okay, it's being deemed incomplete. Um, at this time then, um, would any, um, all those in favor of incompletion? Those not in favor of incompletion? It looks like this has been deemed incomplete. And um, can I make any comments to that? Or we have to, if, so if it's been we, deemed incomplete? I mean, if you deem it incomplete, you should give the applicant some idea of what information you would need to make it complete. OK, I've deemed it complete. So if, well, I voted complete, but it has been deemed incomplete. If anyone would like to make some comments. I can make a stab at it, but yeah, Elaine, the lawyer. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't analyzed the documents here. It just seems to me from what we've heard, we don't have sufficient evidence that, that the party in front of us, Stephanie, and even were we assuming that Stephen were joining in the application, which at this point he's not, um, that those parties have sufficient legal rights to be applying for this road be used as access for the back lot, which seems to be what the request is. So I think we need to know that this, the legal rights are here before we actually review um, the document. And then, on the, um, then the rest of it is just technically determining whether the engineer is sufficiently satisfied. But that's the reason that I don't think it's complete. OK. Anyone else like to add to that? OK. Likewise. Then that would be at this point where we would have to um, ask for that information coming forward. Um, yeah, then we are. If it's deemed incomplete, we can't go forward with we'll any more yeah. questions. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then. Okay, then, the next item is public comment. This would be items not on tonight's agenda. Would anyone like to address the board 
on items not on tonight's agenda. Seeing no one then, um, the board will now consider adjournment. Would anyone like to make a motion? Motion we adjourn. And second by Joe. Okay, all those in favor of adjournment? Those opposed, we are adjourned. Thank you.